Ian, Ian, are you still watching TV again on politics? It's, I mean, it's cut. I mean, it's not really calmed down. But where are you this time? Come on, I, I we in need the to kitchen. do. Why, kitchen. Why are you in the kitchen? It's really it's warm. Just, it's very warm, and very I warm. thought I'm trying to fit the entire recording studio in this extremely large fridge we have. You know, obviously, that the giant brain HQ is non-Euclidean in nature, so I thought I'd fit, try and fit the recording studio into the fridge. Right, fit the whole recording studio, seats, recording equipment, yeah. and and all the extra stuff that you demand into a normal-sized fridge. Yeah, it does turn out that this fridge is normal-sized. I, I thought it was also non-Euclidean, but apparently it's not. No, so. we couldn't get non Euclidean fridges. They wouldn't deliver till three months down the line. They're backed up. Why don't we just stick a couple of fans in the office? I mean, I guess that'll do. I'll stick some silent fans in there. It'll be like you'll never hear them on the recording. Silent fans. Silent fans. Like most of our fans. Those oh, look hey. that's a bird on our very dear fans. Hello there. I am Jamie Adams. And I'm Ian McAllister, and I apologise for the burn. And this is Brainwaves episode 103, bringing you the best in tabletop gaming news. These are the headlines for the week of 25th of July, 2022. Peterson Games Consumed by Troubles. Mythic Games Kidnaps Your Games. And Roll20 Meets the DMs Guild in a Tavern. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. Pearson Games, publishers of Cthulhu Wars and Plant Apocalypse, seem to be running into some trouble with their latest crowdfunding efforts and the company in general. Concerns were raised when an ex-member of staff, George Botello, took to Facebook to criticise the way Peterson Games had handled firing him and a large number of other staff members. He complained about the way he was informed, the paycheck they were promised if they had to be laid off was not forthcoming, and that the layoff happened shortly after the birth of his son and couldn't have come at a worse time. Arthur Peterson responded to the post on the Peterson Games Discord, giving their side of the story. They said they were still going to pay the July check, that they knew that George was obviously busy with the birth of his first child and didn't want to do this by email. They went on to say that there were a variety of other things that they didn't want to discuss because the conversation with George was a private conversation. We'll link to all the bits and pieces we've got from the Discord and from the original Facebook post that George made uh, into the show notes as well. Concerns have also been raised on BoardGameGeek about the company's Kickstarter fulfillment, and some projects are now overdue. It was confirmed by Arthur Peterson that it is likely that backers for Cthulhu Wars Kickstarter, the most recent one, will be asked to pay more money. They also have other Kickstarters unfulfilled at the moment, so how they're going to manage to do that with less staff is anyone's guess. And we're not going to chat about Kickstarter stuff just yet until Jamie's told you the next headline from Mythic Games. The Kickstarter for the board game adaptation of the hit computer game, Darkest Dungeon, stay with me, it ended in late 2020. Now the publishers, Mythic Games, have posted an update on their website, and they've got a favour to ask for their backers. A favour of the monetary, more please kind. Reading from the their update, When we ended the Kickstarter campaign on November 6th, 2020, the situation was nothing like it is today. COVID and then the war in Ukraine led to a significant increase in costs, not only of manufacturing, but also, and especially, of shipping and delivery. The shipping costs have increased by an average of 600%. The costs of raw materials, paper, cardboard, plastic, have increased by at least 30%. Today, the shipping costs to get these games to you are $3.1 million, which is $1.4 million more than the $1.7 million paid by backers. On top of that, there was an additional $350,000 in manufacturing costs due to the increase in oil and raw materials. That's a total of $1.75 million in additional costs to be paid. So what they're saying is, you give us some more money and we'll give you, you'll get your game. Or you can try and get a refund from us. No promises. Or, or you can wait and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's it's a very weird one, because they, they do say in their update that Mythic and the publishers of Darkest Dungeon, uh, a computer game company called Red Hook, are going to cover about half of the $1.75 million, and they're trying to get extra money from backers to cover the other half of that. Now, this isn't unusual in the last year or two. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies being hit by unexpected rise in shipping costs, which have been astronomical. 
But it's just the way they're going about it. They're basically saying you won't get your game for quite some time if you don't pay up. There's there was a weird implication in one of the updates that basically the get the individual games would be in China, and if you don't pay for your individual game, you just won't get it. Which kind of implied they were shipping them individually, which would be madness. That's obviously not what's happening. There's ways to go about doing this, right? I mean, obviously Peterson Games are in trouble as well. We've seen other companies ask for this. I believe Oathsworn had some problems recently. And the, and we've seen companies ask for extra money and get it, because a lot of backers are quite understanding that sometimes things go wrong, Kickstars. And it just feels like Mythic are going about this in the wrong way. They're basically holding the games hostage. Just remember, everyone, Kickstarters are not a certain thing. Hmm. Absolutely, your periodical reminder that Kickstarter is not a store, no matter how much it looks like one. And Kickstarter kind of likes it to be one, but also not at the same time. Remember, you are, in effect, gambling with your money. If you want to break it down base to the basis form, you are gambling with your money, and hopefully you might get something that might be worth it. Absolutely. Fair way of putting it. Well, we'll, we'll hope to hear something out of Mythic in the next uh, couple of weeks when we come back for episode 104, and we'll update you at that time. Right, moving away from Kickstarter, let's go on to other web-based uh, tabletop applications. Ian, roll 20. Indeed. On Cast 102, we reported on the move by DMs Guild, the premier Dungeons & Dragons PDF site, to partner up with Roll20, the premier virtual tabletop site so that creators could sell tie-ins for Roll20 through the DMs Guild. Well, it seems that tie-up is just the beginning, as One Bookshelf, the company that runs DMs Guild and drives through RPG, which is the sort of big version of DMs Guild, which publishes all sorts of PDFs, not just Dungeons & Dragons ones, are becoming partners. From the statement, First, this is an integration inspired by passion for tabletop gaming between two successful companies with a shared vision for the future. Roll20 and One Bookshelf both see critical competencies in one another that we know will lead to even greater success. Roll20's roadmap has included expanding and improving their marketplace, and One Bookshelf's goal has long been to expand into the virtual tabletop space. Together we are the best way to buy, organise and play tabletop RPGs online. This statement goes on to extol some of the benefits of the link-up, including being able to access your drive through library from inside Roll20, a better marketplace for Roll20, and various other technical upgrades. From the end of the statement, the industry-leading marketplace with 11 distinct storefronts joining the world's foremost VTT is just the beginning. Having a combined team now 80 strong, including roughly 50 developers, designers, content experts, and product managers, we are poised to create a host of improvements and new tools. We aim to be the best place to find, buy, create, sell, collect, organize, and play your tabletop role-playing games, whether virtual or in person. We've only begun to imagine what we can do together. Honestly, this seems like a fairly logical next step for these two companies they've already sort of partnered up a little bit in, in making dm's guild stuff available on roll 20 and yeah i can only see that expanding in the future i mean me i mean you and i jamie have speculated quite a lot that wizards will put together their own vtt in yep. the future when almost like, certainly if, when sixth edition comes out but maybe this is just the start of that if dm dm's guild being kind of part of wizards of the coast Maybe they will just buy Roll20 and do it that way. Speculate wildly. On to the rest of the news, and I think we've got some awards up first. Yes, of course. Now, as we promised you, it's the Spiele des Jahres Awards. They happened on the 16th of July. The winners of the Spiele des Jahres main award and the Kennerspiel were awarded. The winner of the Kennerspiel, again, that's the translation is a bit more uh, nebulous. I've seen it called the Connoisseurs Game uh, Award. I don't like that, but it's the closest I can think of. Was won by Living Forest by Aska Christensen and published by Ludonaut and Pegasus Spiel. And the winner of the Spiele des Jahres 2022 was Cascadia by Randy Flynn from Flat Out Games. They joined Zauberberg, the Kinderspiel winner uh, from earlier, to form the trifecta of games for 2022. Congratulations to the winners. And I think it's interesting that both the announced winners uh, at the most recent ceremony are all about nature. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a trend towards different themes, right? starting with kind of Wingspan and then moving forward. We've 
got more interesting themes coming out. And I think that kind of stuff really attracts the ger- the German judges. They're always a bit more about family friendly themes and approachable games. So yeah, good to see. And our uh, one of our Discord members, Hal Duncan, was there because his game uh, Cryptid was up for an award. Didn't win, unfortunately, but yeah, I, he was sharing some photos from the ceremony, which looked like a lot of fun. But it's still going. I was one of the three games nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. Yeah. That's extremely. great. Yeah, absolutely. Even that nomination sticker is going to be like, boom, that's going to get you something. And if, and if people are wondering, but Cryptid has been out for years. Just remember, this is the availability of games in German when they're considered for the Spiele Award. And last year was the first time that Cryptid was available in German. Indeed. Congratulations to all the winners and the nominees. I hate to do this to you, Ian. TSR are back in the news. Uh, the new one? one. The new one. Of course it's us. Look, we're never talking about the old TSR, really. It's a news yeah. show. We've got to do the new it's, well, TSR. Well, I think it's the new, new, new one, right? It is the newest TSR, and there are a bunch of scumbags. We have reported many times on the frankly awful behaviour of the current incarnation of Tactical Studies Rules, or TSR, the studio that in its original inception created Dungeons & Dragons. The current TSR has tried suing Wizards of the Coast, posting anti-woke memes, just anything to get people to just love them again. One of those efforts involves publishing a new version of Star Frontiers, a sci-fi role-playing game originally published in 1982, representing the then TSR's first foray into science fiction games. Well, the new version is sure to have you reaching for a sick bag rather than your dice bag. A leak of the playtest version of Star Frontiers New Genesis, as it is titled, included the following awful things. I apologise a little bit in advance for some of the words I'm about to use, as I understand many may find them offensive, but we feel it is necessary to inform you of the story. We got all these snippets from a few threads that have been shared on Twitter. The example of races segment of the book lists a Negro race, a subspecies of the superior Nordic race. Nordic are described as tall, blonde, blue-eyed, whereas Negro are tall, thick-bodied, dark-skinned, and have average intelligence. Later in the book is written, Races in Star Frontiers are not unlike races in the real world. Some are better at certain things than others, and some races are superior than others. It lists BLM, Black Lives Matter, and Antifa, or anti-fascist ideology, as radical under theology. Just today, there were some links from someone who has access to the new TSR files, the company files, which appears to just be a drive file, a Google Drive file, which shows a list of people that the company considers enemies. It includes the names alongside a column titled Hater Notes. That column includes comments like, Do not trust woke in giant capital letters, and other such inane ramblings. There are promises from the people who have access to this of more leaks to come. In response to these leaks, TSR Hobby's Facebook page posted this. Okay, this has gone out of hand with the attacks and lies, misrepresentation and slander. I will say this once, this crap being spread around is photoshopped lies. And if this is the level folks need to stoop to to attack people, it will all come out in the end. FYI, the First Amendment will not protect you if you are lying. Just before we came on the cast, and uh, Jamie and I were just chatting about this before we started recording, I went to look at the TSR Hobby's page because... We're trying to do our job well. We want to look and actually see that things that are shared, like screenshots, captures, that kind of thing, are actually real. They're not photoshopped. Uh, and we, I went to look at the TSR Hobbies page, and it is a complete trash fire. You should not go and look at it. Trust me on this. You do not want to look into the heart of darkness. It is not good. Apart from that statement, which is genuine, and I read, I read directly off the TSR Hobbies Facebook page, there is a bunch of other stuff that would have you both raising both eyebrows so high that they go to the moon. It's not good. TSR, new TSR. Listen, I I know you're probably not going to listen, but hi, hi, it's Jamie here. Um, If you're listening, hello, what are you doing here? Uh, I've got to tell you that I know that you get really upset because paladins don't have to be lawful good anymore and people (gasps) have different ideas to your old-style role-playing. And your wasp nonsense. But you know what? You lot are so insignificant. You are clinging to the decaying remains of something you try in vain to venerate. You beat your chest. You throw your toys out the pram because you know how pitiful you are. Go play your 
stupid games with your chud friends because no one else is going to play with you no matter how many monster stat blocks you've memorized what jamie just said yeah just they are like truly off they have just like truly truly descended into just rambling madness now staying briefly with horrible people in the role-playing game sphere jamie Back in episode 73, we reported that an attempt by Zach S., the RPG creator, alleged abuser, and all-round unpleasant individual, to sue Gen Con for damages had been dismissed. The lawsuit was over Gen Con banning Zach from the convention due to accusations from his ex-wife over his behaviour. He has also attempted to sue his ex-wife for defamation. Now, laws are nothing if not really complex at times, and it seems now that the dismissal has been overturned, that some elements of the case can indeed proceed. Effectively, the defamation parts of the lawsuit may proceed, but all other aspects remain dismissed. These include casting Zach S. in false light and intentional interference with a business expectation. At the moment, we don't know if Zach S. will try and continue with the lawsuit or not, but stay tuned. Again, a bad apple, but there are people who are going to still defend him. Absolutely. And uh, I'm looking at the TSR Hobbies page earlier. There's people defending them on there as well. It's pretty disgusting. You want, we keep saying, and I'm, I'm going to say this again, and I, I'm going to say this again, I say it a lot. We keep saying, I say we as in tabletop players, we say that our hobby, our industry is welcoming and we accept everyone. That couldn't be further from the truth. We're deluding ourselves if we think we are so wonderfully brilliant. Sure, we're better than some, but that doesn't make us good. We need to make concerted efforts. It's not enough to be just against abuse. You've got to be anti-abuse. It's not enough to be against, let's say, fascism. You've got to be anti-fascist. And one of the ways we do that is informing you about terrible people in the industry. I know some out there would say that drawing attention to these people is kind of what they want. But I believe you can draw attention to these stories without giving them the air of publicity as well. I urge you not to go look at TSR Hobby's page or anything Zach S. Dunn does, for instance. Or, or indeed, giving them Just, the air of air. From one issue that seems pretty black and white to another black and white issue, news from the world of chess. Magnus Carlsen is the current world chess champion. In the first episode of his new podcast, The Magnus Effect, he announced that he would not be defending that title in 2023. He said, I found that the negative of championships has started to outweigh the positive, even when winning. Being result-oriented has worked out for me in these matches, but doesn't feel sustainable long-term. Passion must be the main driver. Carson was keen to emphasise he wasn't retiring, and that he would still be an active player in chess. He has a few games lined up, including the Grand Chess Tour of Croatia and the Olympiad in Chennai. I believe last time we reported on Magnus Carlsen, he was aiming for the coveted 2900 ELO rating, with his last match with Sergei Karjagan prevented him from getting as it ended in a draw. Carlson currently sits at 2864 ELO. The ELO, for people who don't want to go back and listen to the podcast, and fair enough, it's to do with like even like a winning streak, and it's how good you are. Even better than just being the world chess champion, it's like almost a perfect clean sheet. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a measure of like, the people you play and you're rating against them and how much the difference is, all sorts of things. It's, it's quite a complicated formula. With Carson out of the World Championships, Ding Liren, the world number two, will go against Ian Nepomniachi. Uh, we wish Magnus Carson all the best for a less competitive life. Uh, no doubt he's still going to be a big part of the world chess scene. And yeah, we all continue to bring you little, little chess updates every now and again when something interesting happens in that world. It's definitely part of the hobby. Jamie, UK RPG publishers doing interesting things. One of the largest UK RPG companies is Modifius Entertainment, the publishing house between such games as Mutant Chronicles, Star Trek Adventures, and the recently released Dune RPG. They have just announced that they will be opening up their 2D20 system that powers all the aforementioned RPGs and is their kind of in-house system to the public. Under the 2D20 World Builders program, Fans and designers can create their own content using the 2D20 system and release it for free or for sale. A systems reference document, or an SRD, will be available that contains the core mechanics of the system. Now, the program will also allow other companies to license the 2D20 system to create products. 
It will include development and promotional support and will tie into the VIA Modiphius program that helps indie creators co-publish games with Modiphius. And that's going to be launching in August. I mean, we've seen in the past the OSR, other SRDs. Yeah, Blades, for one of my favourite games, for instance, has an SRD and has seen a bunch of spin-off games like Scum and Villainy, which I've written about. And a lot, a lot of the successful RPGs that gain a bit of success tend to do this. They tend to open up the system for like other people to play with. So Apocalypse World obviously has its SRD out there for people to play around with, and there's a lot of Apocalypse World hacks. And yeah, I think this is Medivius trying to replicate a little bit of some of the success of the DMs Guild, like opening up their properties for creators to come and play with them and make and, money and why wouldn't or not. It? Yeah, absolutely. Why wouldn't it? Seems like a good idea. It's my turn to talk about small cartoon animals. Usually it's Jamie. Since the 90s, children and adults have been jostling to be the very best like no one ever was through the Pokemon trading card game. Now there may be a chance to finally prove it. A casting call in the Los Angeles area is looking for energetic, personable candidates of all ages and their families for an exciting new opportunity for a reality show based around the trading card game and wants prospective contestants to describe how a Pokemon TCG expert can help you. In a press release alongside the announcement, Barry Sams, vice president of the Pokemon TCG, said, From dedicated competitors in the Play Pokemon program and casual players battling after school with friends and family to collectors or general enthusiasts, we're looking forward to spotlighting the stories of our diverse TCG fans. So it's looking maybe like contestants of varying levels of experience will be coached by TCG experts. No other info, no other info is available right now. Maybe more coming soon. I mean, I think we said this on the last cast when we were talking about properties, that there's a lot of streaming services out there looking for content. So I can understand the Pokemon company getting into something like this and putting it out on like Hulu or HBO or... Disney or something, yeah. Makes I don't know sense. if it would go for Disney. I feel like mm. it would maybe go Netflix. I feel like Netflix. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of surprised. Well, I'm kind of surprised. Maybe I'm just completely ignorant about this. I'm kind of surprised there's not been a Pokemon like themed reality show already. Or maybe there hasn't. I don't know. It is possible there may have been one in Japan because reality shows are a staple of their television. That's true. Yeah. But and. Oh, I wonder if I'd get a Magic the Gathering one at some point as well. Someone's got to be thinking about. Someone's got to be looking at this and thinking about that, right? Yeah, but the other thing is, how fun is it to just watch someone just move a card around and go, "I've played three cards and I've won because I have this massive engine but, that I just set off." I mean, that the Pokemon card game can look like that as well. No, that is the, true at the high levels. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question. How do you make a, po- a game of Pokemon look like an exciting TV episode, right? That is an interesting question. Uh, sure. How do they do it in the World Series of Poker? Yeah. Lots of camera angles. Lots, lots and, and lots, lots of camera, of camera angles. angles. Anyway, people who don't need to be made to look more exciting are fantastic patrons. We'd like to thank you all very much for continuing to support the cast, especially our executive producers, James Naylor and Sean Newman. We'll link to all of James and Sean's efforts in the show notes. Uh, you can join them on our Patreon, which is from $1 a month. You get an extended version of the cast and a little update every month as to what you can look forward to from Jamie and I in the forthcoming month. Uh, there are various other ways to support us on the site including the lovely t-shirts from Sir Meeple and Dice from Metallic Dice Games, who are both excellent companies. Um, please go and check them out. And we'd just like to give a wee shout out to Tabletop Scotland. Uh, it's upcoming on the 27th, 28th of August. We are both going to be there. I'll be there both days, uh, just playing games and wandering around. And they are currently looking for a few more volunteers for both the Saturday and the Sunday of the con. If you go to the Tabletop Scotland site, there's information on how to volunteer there if you'd like to do so. I might tremble. I'm definitely. I still haven't got a ticket yet, so I'll try and get there. But if not, I might look at volunteering. This no, is not a legally binding listen. contract, Dave. If you're listening, <laughs> just, just take him, Dave. It's fine. What? Ian doesn't mind me working for other people. As, as, long, as long as it's not other podcasts, you traitor. <sighs> Never gonna let that go. Ian, you got six guesses as to what our last story is about. Uh, Monopoly cakes. 
Monopoly Cakes. Well, some of the letters in that are are right, but I can't be bothered telling you which ones because I can't be bothered with... Try to work out. <laughs> yeah. So, that's right. You may have guessed from my horribly ham-fisted attempt at humour. Welsh word game Wordle from Welsh designer Josh Wardle, now owned by the New York Times Company, is coming to a table near you. In the frankly barren word guessing game market, oh, there's none there at all, is there? It's Wordle. But it's a competitive word guessing game. Like the app, players will have six guesses as to a five letter word from one controlling player, who will reveal correct letter placements or correct letter in incorrect placements as you go on. And I'm pretty certain it's going to be like Wordle the game, the app. Because you can tell everyone how you did at Wordle the game via Wordle the game, the app. Alongside Wordle the app. This seems like kind of a weird thing. Like, I, I mean, like, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. Uh, I, I mean, kind of, but just weird. It's weird. <laughs> I don't get it. Playing well, Wordle's fine. I stopped playing it. But wherever it's fine. Yeah, cool. I... I'm going to be really hip and go, oh, I, d- I don't play Wordle. Wordle annoys me. Uh, I I am even more of a nerd in that I play Wordle, where you get a country's outline. That's good. I, have you, I have play you tried f- Framed? I was about to say, I do Framed, where you get six still images, uh, frames from a, a film, you've got to guess it. And I'm also a big fan of Flaggle. With guessing one flags, G. I'm guessing? It's Guessing Flags, yeah. Uh, I quite like it. And occasionally I'll do Hurdle, but I'm not very good at it. Well, dear listeners, you've got six guesses to figure out what we're going to be talking about on the next podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you like what you've listened to, then the best way to help us out is to share the podcast and drop us a review and rating on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, You can come and join us in our Discord, where every Tuesday after the cast goes out, we get together with some of our community and play games. We will be very, very welcome along. Uh, our website is giantbrain.co.uk and you can email us about anything in the cast or anything you'd like us to cover in future casts at giantbrainuk at gmail.com thank you very much bye for now bye bye no pazaran <laughs>